so welcome everyone to this uh, very interesting webinar, which is going to be given by uh, Professor Maj Majid Nazem. He is from the School of Engineering at the RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia, and he's going to talk about a bit of a, um, let's say, a hot topic, uh, machine learning and AI and that kind of thing, uh, and how it applies to uh, geomechanics. Um, so we we uh, we ran. I'd like to just also welcome you, Majid. Um, thanks for for coming to give this talk. It's something that I know a lot of people have been looking forward to, including myself. And uh, so we ran these webinars, uh, these Optum webinars some time ago, and then we had a break. And now we are sort of picking them up again. And I don't think there's any better way to start this new series than um, than with you, Majid, and the topic that you're going to talk awesome. about today. So uh, I'll, I will uh, hand over to you. OK. Uh, thank you, Christian. And... Uh... Well, hello everyone. And let me start by sharing my screen. All right, okay, let's uh, get into it. Um, if it's okay, I'll turn off my uh, video so you can <laughs> you can focus on the presentation, not my uh, not my uh, not my video. Okay, uh, so the topic, uh, as Christian mentioned, is on the application of machine learning methods in geotechnical engineering. Um, uh, please let me begin by acknowledgement of the country. RMIT University acknowledges the people of the Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung language groups of the Eastern Koli Nation on whose unceded lands we conduct the business of the university. RMIT respectfully uh, acknowledges their ancestors and elders, past and present. RMIT also acknowledges the traditional custodians and their ancestors of the lands and waters across Australia where we conduct our um, business. Uh, I would also like to begin my presentation by thanking the organization uh, organiz organizers of this webinar, the University of Liverpool and uh, Optum Company. I am honored to be here. Thank you, Christian, for inviting me for the second time, and I hope this webinar is useful, although I don't consider myself an expert in uh, uh, machine learning and AI. Also, uh, I thank all the audi audience for attending this uh, presentation. Now, uh, who am I? That's the easiest slide to talk about. Um, so before getting into the interesting topic of machine learning, let me introduce myself. I received my uh, bachelor in civil engineering back uh, a few years ago, and then did my master's in structural engineering and finally PhD in geotech in 2006 at the University of Newcastle in Australia. I worked there for, uh, uh, seven, eight years between 2007 and 2015. And then in 2016, I moved to RMIT University in Melbourne. Um, and currently I'm a professor in civil engineering at RMIT. My expertise are mainly, uh, well, mainly includes uh, computational mechanics and geomechanics. And recently I've done some work in machine learning and AI uh, as well. Now, uh, where is Melbourne? So that's the map of Australia and we are somewhere uh, down the bottom uh, on the uh, Southeast coast um, of Australia. And I remember um, last presentation here was about two years ago during the uh, lockdown. And I, uh, well, Melbourne was in a severe lockdown at that time but now everything is uh, back to normal and no one talks even talks about uh, COVID anymore. And that's uh, fantastic. Uh, RMIT University was originally established back in 1887 as a college and it remained as a working men's college until 1933. And it was established as a university uh, back in 1992. We are a relatively large university. We have three campuses in Melbourne, uh, one in CBD, one in Bandura, one in Brunswick. We also have uh, overseas uh, campuses, one in Vietnam, Hong Kong, and also we have a branch at uh, in Spain called RMIT Europe. 
Now this work, I've had the pleasure and I still have the privilege of working with this amazing team in the area of AI over the past few years. I have learned a lot from these people and I'm still learning from them. Um, obviously, um, our work in AI is not is not limited here, uh, is not limited to this presentation. And uh, we have done works in different areas of civil engineering as well, such as uh, transport engineering. But my focus here will be on the application uh, of machine learning in geotechnical uh, engineering. Okay, uh, this is the outline of my presentation. Quite simple, why machine learning, why now? Um, uh, what are the ML methods, the most of all, let's say the most popular methods uh, of machine learning, how to use them and which uh, machine learning method is basically uh, appropriate for which application. So I will provide some ex several examples and we'll discuss and compare the performance of these methods um, for a few geotechnical applications. Uh, and after that, so what are the conclusions and what we're gonna do from here? I also need to add a note about the literature review. Uh, basically due to the short period of this presentation, I cannot uh, conduct a comprehensive or even a short uh, literature review on uh, the topic discussed here. Well, this does not mean I have intentionally ignored the published works, but honestly, the publication is so huge that cannot be covered during uh, this presentation. Okay, uh, let's talk about solution methods. We all know we have uh, different strategies for solving a geotechnical application. Closed form explicit solutions is one of them. And these are very limited to some uh, classical problems like bearing capacity of wooding, for instance, you can find a close uh, expl or explicit solution. Uh, now, you may also conduct laboratory testing or use laboratory tests to find the solution. And we also have numerical methods, which is another uh, basically topic. Um, we have finite elements, we have meshless methods and so on. And um, now we are thinking about machine learning and uh, the question is, is machine learning actually a solution method, uh, can be considered as a solution method for geotechnical applications? And I hope I can uh, shed light on this topic during this presentation. Okay, during my presentation, I will use AI and ML machine learning terms. It's good to answer the very basic question at the very beginning, if these two concepts are identical or what's the difference? Uh, well, the answer is, Basically, no, these two are not identical. Well, as the name suggests, uh, artificial intelligence aims to create uh, intelligent machines that can perform tasks uh, which normally require human or our intelligence, uh, such as uh, recognizing speech, for instance, making decisions and understanding a language. Uh, AI can be achieved through a variety of uh, techniques and one of them is machine learning. So machine learning is essentially a subset of artificial intelligence that involves the development of, let's say, algorithm or methods, if you like, that can learn from data and improve their performance over time. In other words, machine learning uh, algorithms can recognize patterns and make um, in a data, and they can use that information to make predictions or take actions without being explicitly programmed to do so. Uh, we have two main categories in machine learning. One is called supervised, the other one is unsupervised. So supervised learning is basically a type of machine learning where the algorithm learns to make predictions or classifications based on uh, training data. And this data refers to basically input data that has already been categorized or classified based on a specific set of uh, features. So the algorithm uses this data to learn uh, the patterns and relationships between the features and then applies this uh, learning to make predictions or classifications on new uh, data. So supervised learning is commonly used for tasks such as 
Uh, some examples are here, classification. Uh, uh, for instance, if you receive an email and you want to classify it as spam or non-spam, that's a classification uh, problem. Uh, regression, we will see uh, some examples during this presentation, predicting, for instance, predicting the price of a house based on uh, its features, suburb, its location, size, the number of bedrooms, and so on. Image recognition, let's say you have, uh, a, you, have a, you have an image and then you want to, uh, for instance, identify an, a specific object in the image or like if you want to identify a dog in, a, in an image. Well, uh, we also have uh, unsupervised learning, which is not really the uh, subject of this presentation. We will mainly focus on supervised learning, but uh, supervised Unsupervised learning is a type of machine learning where the algorithm is not provided with uh, labeled data. Instead, the it's left uh, to find patterns and relationships in the data on its own. So what I mean, for instance, um, when we talk about uh, an example is clustering. Clustering, uh, let's say uh, you want to group customers of a shop based on their purchasing behavior or their uh, preferences. Another one is asso association uh, rule learning. Uh, this um, this uh, means, for instance, discovering the relationships between items in a data set, such as uh, frequently buy uh, together items in a grocery uh, in a grocery store. As an example, but as I said, our main focus is on supervised learning. Okay, typical uh, machine learning uh, procedure. The first is data collection. Uh, the first step in any machine learning project is to collect the relevant data. This data can be obtained from vari uh, various sources, come from experimental tests, from uh, simulations from sensors and so on. Uh, next is data preparation. Once the data is collected, it needs to be cleaned and uh, pre-processed, if you like. So this means, for instance, removing uh, missing values, uh, handling outliers, and uh, normalizing the data to ensure it is in a consistent form. Uh, next one is feature uh, engineering. Uh, involves selecting and transferring the most relevant features of the data to improve the performance of your uh, algorithm. And then model selection. So after the data is prepared, the next step to is to select an appropriate machine learning algorithm uh, that fits the problem uh, you are dealing with. Depending on the data and the problem type, this can be a supervised or unsupervised learning algorithm. But uh, as I said here, we mainly focus on uh, supervised uh, algorithms or methods. Next, uh, you usually divide your data into different groups. And one of these uh, subsets is used for training the model. So the algorithm is trained on the prepared data set. Then the algorithm learns from the data and adjusts its uh, parameters to minimize the error between its predictions and the actual values in the training uh, data set. Uh, next is the model evaluation. So after the model has been trained, you need to evaluate and assess its performance. And this is typically done by testing the model on a separate uh, test data set that was not used for the training. Uh, next one, and finally, uh, deployment of the model. So when your after your model is trained and has been evaluated, it can be deployed and applied in a real world application. So this is the typical ML procedure, but not the only way to do uh, machine learning. Uh, we often talk about uh, hybridization and. In machine learning, this term basically uh, refers to the process of combining uh, multiple alg algorithms or techniques uh, together in order to, uh, let's say, create a more powerful or effective uh, prediction, uh, predictive uh, system. 
here uh, we mainly refer to optimization algorithms which are employed to improve the performance of machine learning algorithms by tuning their input parameters. And I will talk about uh, some of these techniques during this presentation. Um, another thing that uh, we also do is in some cases, we conduct um, a cross validation, for instance, to nominate the best performing, uh, the best performing method, and then tune the hyperparameters of that uh, method for uh, even for better uh, performance. And yeah, we will see this in uh, future slides as well. So some of the examples of machine learning, learning methods, I will not explain all of them, but I will mention uh, some of them uh, perhaps a bit quickly. And then because I want to get to the interesting part of um, their applications in uh, geotechnical uh, engineering. So linear regression is a type of supervised machine learning, actually. So perhaps uh, we all uh, start learning machine learning even in the maybe the first year or uh, the first year of university or even high school when you are introduced into linear regression. So this is actually a supervised machine learning algorithm used to model the relationship between a dependent variable um, and one or more independent variables also known as predictors or features. Uh, so the goal is of linear regression is basically to find the best fit line that describes the relationship between the dependent and independent uh, variables. In this uh, simple linear regression, there is only one independent variable and the best fit line is determined by minimizing the sum of square um, differences between the predicted values and the actual values of the independent of the dependent variables. Well, this uh, is basically called the cost function, and every machine learning uh, method has uh, such a function in a different form. And the I, the goal of the machine learning algorithm is to minimize this cost function over a set of let's say uh, training uh, examples. Now, how is this done? This is done, achieved by adjusting the parameters of the model to make uh, better predictions. And a good, uh, a good cost function should be um, perhaps a smooth, should be differentiable and convex so that it's easy to optimize using uh, optimization methods, for instance, gradient-based uh, methods. So JW, this is the cost function, W, is the vector of regression coefficients. Uh, X either are quite uh, obvious and N here is the number of training examples. So the goal of linear regression is to find the values of W that maximizes, sorry, uh, that minimizes this uh, cost uh, function. So once the best fit line has been established then you can use it for to make predictions about the uh, dependent variables for new values uh, of the independent uh, variables. Uh, so when we say that regression is basically a machine learning method, don't be surprised that there are over 10 different regression methods in machine learning. Uh, another one is called uh, ridge regression. Ridge regression is basically a regular regularization technique used in machine learning to prevent the overfitting issue in a linear regression. And it's very similar to linear regression, but uh, with an additional penalty term, uh, which is added to the cost uh, function. All this method is useful when the number of input variables is relatively large and the data is noisy or collinear. Uh, the other one is Bayesian regression. Uh, another type of regression analysis that uses Bayesian interface to estimate the uh, parameters of a regression model. In traditional regression analysis, the objective is to find the values of the model parameters that um, best fit the data. Uh, BR uh, takes a um, probabilistic approach actually, where the model parameters are treated as random variables. Um, that's another regression. 
we have a bagging regression uh, and also this is another one automatic relevance determination regression um, instead of explaining uh, these methods one by one there's a very good uh, website or reference actually for these uh, machine learning methods and if you are interested i um, suggest that you uh, visit this website and um, you can basically find all these uh, definitions and also the uh, Python functions for all uh, these methods. Okay, another method is decision tree, another supervised machine learning method uh, in which the uh, models are built in the uh, flowchart-like uh, structure. So decision tree is built using recursive partitioning, which is generally known as divide and conquer approach. And as you see uh, on this figure, a decision tree consists of two or more branches in which a leaf uh, node represents a classification or decision. Uh, next one that is to be introduced is random forest. So random forest, as the name suggests, is basically um, a method which includes decision trees. So in this method, the basic idea is to create a number of decision trees or a forest, if you like, uh, each of which is trained on a subset of the original data. And these subsets are chosen uh, randomly. Well, these uh, trees are unpruned, they are different from each other and are built randomly. And uh, the final predictions of the random forest are made by aggregating the predictions of all the individual trees. So as the figure shows, there are three steps uh, here. So first you, um, first one is about selecting samples from the data set by uh, a random selection. And then you need to build your uh, decision trees for each sample and get the prediction result from each decision tree. And uh, eventually you uh, perform a vote for the result of each prediction and select the most voted prediction result as the final uh, prediction, which is called majority voting. I understand that this is uh, like the theory part of this presentation, but I've got two or three more slides about this, and then we will talk about the applications of this method. So bear with me for a few more minutes, and I apologize for the uh, boring uh, theory of these methods. A uh, famous one is artificial neural network. ANN is a type of machine learning model that is inspired by the whole oh, structure and the function of uh, our brain or the neurons in our brain, actually. Uh, this uh, ANs are designed to recognize complex patterns in data by learning from examples. They consist, uh, and they consist of interconnected nodes, uh, also called neurons, which are organized in two layers. We have input layer, hidden layer, and output layer. So the input layer, it's like um, its uh, duty is to transmit the signal. The hidden layers act as the network's computational engine. And eventually the output layer generates predictions depending on the, um, on the inputs. Okay, uh, next one is uh, an extension of ANN into MPANN or multi-layer perceptron artificial neural network. Um, this is like a feed-forward ANN, which consists of one uh, input layer, only one or more or several hidden layers and one output layer. Again, the input layer uh, receives the signal. The hidden layers are the computational engine of the system and the output layer makes the prediction based on the input. Uh, weights and biases, W and B. W and B are two important parameters here. Weights define the interconnected relationships between um, layer neurons and biases are used to define the degree of freedom uh, of the system. Uh, perhaps 
two more to go. K and N uh, or K nearest neighbor is a non-parametric supervised method and can be used in classification as well as regression problems. So the algorithm works based on the um, feature similarity, which means a value is assigned to the new point based on how close it is uh, to the points in the training data set. So uh, the algorithm actually includes four steps. We choose a value for k. k is one of the input parameters or hyperparameters of this method. Uh, for each point in data test data set, we calculate distance to all data points in the training data set, and then select the k data points with the lowest distance, and eventually conduct a majority vote uh, among those data points, and the dominating values in that pool are decided as the final uh, values. Uh, LDA, or linear discriminant uh, analysis, uh, this is used for finding a linear combination of features that can basic, uh, that can separate uh, the data points in two different classes or uh, groups, basically. So in the example I've shown here, um, we have two sets of data points belonging to uh, different classes, let's say blue and green. Um, so when we plot the data points in two dimensions, actually we can't find a straight line that uh, separates the two classes of these uh, data points thoroughly. So in LDA method, a new axis is found uh, and the data are projected onto that new ax axis um, based on these two principles. So we want to maximize the distance between uh, means of the two classes and minimize the variation within each classes. So that's how we convert from two, di two dimensions into one dimension on one uh, axis, or we can do uh, impl uh, employ the same concept for from 3D to 2D and uh, so on. Okay, uh, support vector machine. This is a very uh, robust, uh, uh, machine learning method. Again, it's supervised and it's commonly used for three main purposes, including uh, it's used for classification, uh, it's used for pattern recognition, and also regression. Um, if you have seen the SVR, SVR is basically support vector machine, but used for regression. You might have seen SVC, that's support vector for classification. So in, uh, this, in this method, basically by assuming a data set of N samples and uh, supposing that a rep uh, represented type of result is Y, uh, a set of training vectors D is written according to um, this equation. N is the number of influencing uh, features that exist in N dimensional space. Now the SVM algorithm usually uses a technique called um, kernel trick, which transforms the data into a higher dimensional space where it is possible to separate the classes. So any function f of x in SVM kernel trick can be shown by uh, this equation. And W represents uh, the vector of output layer. B is the bias and x is defined as an um, n by n um, matrix. Now, uh, we need to minimize uh, this function subjected to this condition in the uh, support vector machine to work out um, to work out W and uh, B. So it's an, basically an optimization problem. Okay, I reckon that's the last method. Uh, but not least, and actually this is my favorite one, uh, extreme gradient boosting. So uh, extreme gradient boosting is a powerful machine learning algorithm that's used for both classification and regression. It's an optimized version of the gradient uh, boosting method, um, which was developed back in 2001. So in this method, decision trees are used as the um, weak models. So um, basically, 
this method is based on the principle of uh, ensemble learning where multiple weak uh, models are combined together to uh, create a strong model. And the weak models here are uh, based on uh, decision trees. Now, let's uh, finish this part of introducing this ML methods. Uh, we use some in performance indicators for studying the performance of our uh, machine learning methods. And uh, in most of the uh, examples presented here, I'm using these uh, three indicators. R squared is quite, um, fam looks familiar. Uh, it basically measures uh, one measurement for the error. The other one is root uh, mean squared error or RMSE. Uh, according to this simple equation, we also have a VAF or variance accountant for, for um, measuring the uh, error or studying the performance of a machine learning method. Uh, those, these matrix, uh, matrix are basically used uh, when we use an um, machine learning for uh, prediction. If we want to use it for a classification, there are other uh, metrics to be used for studying the performance. One of them is called accuracy. The other one is um, area under curve. So ACC and AUC. Uh, to understand these two, we need to understand this uh, matrix, which is called com confusion uh, matrix. Okay, so let's say the actual values of a uh, classification or of a prediction can be uh, positive or negative. Now the predicted values can be positive and negative as well. So if it's positive and we are correct, we uh, predicted correctly positive, then this is called a true positive. If the actual value is negative, but the R predi prediction is positive, then it's FP negative, negative is TN true negative, and eventually positive negative is FN. Uh, so accuracy is defined according to the total number of uh, TP, the positive positive, and TN, the true negatives, divided by the total instances. Um, AUC refers, uh, actually refers to the curve, uh, to the area under this curve. The ROC stands for Receiver Operating Characteristic Curve, and um, ROC plots true positive rate um, against the false negative rate at uh, various cutoff values and is used for further uh, analysis of the models. Uh, this graphical plot is usually used to express the uh, predictive ability of a model. Now, both ACC and AUC range between zero and one. So zero represents uh, basically totally incorrect prediction and one uh, shows 100% uh, correct. Okay. Uh, thanks, God. That part is over, and now we uh, do some um, study of these uh, methods for different applications in geomechanics. Uh, I start by bearing capacity of piles in sand. Uh, well, basically, the bearing capacity of pile in sand uh, depends on the on QS, which is the capacity due to the friction between the pile and the soil and also the capacity of soil under the pile. So the ultimate load capacity of pile may be taken as a sum of the shaft resistance uh, and the based resistance. Obviously, QS depends on the uh, length of the pile, its circumference and the vertical effective uh, stress. And CA, this parameter can be set to zero for driven piles, but maybe non-zero for cast in place piles. And QP, that's the uh, base resistance, uh, depends again at the effective vertical stress at the bottom and also the soil properties. Now, um, here 
uh, it's also important to select the most uh, influencing variables to estimate the bearing capacity of files, not only in this problem, but in any machine learning problem. Uh, this is one of the things that's done at the very beginning to work out the influential parameters and how they affect your um, the result basically. So here we have we are considering five variables, including the uh, soil shear uh, resistance angle at the shaft uh, at the shaft of the pile. Um, we also have the uh, soil um, resistance angle at the tip of the pile, well, phi t, the length of the pile, uh, cross section area, and the effective stress at the tip of the uh, the pile. So um, this matrix basically uh, shows how uh, these, influ these pro different parameters uh, influence the uh, QM, the bearing capacity of the pile. Now the ML procedure, uh, we have uh, studied the performance of uh, six ML algorithms. Uh, for a data set including of 59 cases of driven piles in cohesionless soil. And the aim is to basically um, estimate the bearing capacity through this uh, comparative study. So the six uh, methods are decision three, uh, random forest, uh, KAN, uh, support vector um, machine, and that's um, uh, MLP, artificial and neural network, and XGB, the extreme gradient uh, boosting. So what we have done here, we have uh, um, used approximately 80% of the cases uh, for the training uh, sets, and then 20% of samples uh, to for the testing using a random selection to work out the brain capacity. Uh, okay, now let's have a look at some of the uh, results for the training. First, we have used the uh, six uh, methods for the uh, training of 47 cases of driven piles. So this uh, slide basically shows the regression plots of each of these algorithms. So I'm using R squared here to uh, represent the performance of this method. Obviously, uh, in this case, XGB uh, shows the best performance among the uh, six methods uh, with an R squared of 0 0.9898, uh, uh, which is actually an outstanding performance. This is uh, followed by decision tree. Uh, where is decision tree? Here, 0 0.94, and then um, RF, random forest, with 0 0.92. Obviously, the one with uh, lowest um, performance. In this case is KNN with R squared of 0 0.77. Now, after training, we uh, have used uh, these uh, algorithms for uh, testing. Testing includes uh, 12 examples, which was 20% of the data. And now again, even in testing, um, we can see that still uh, XGB uh, outperforms the others. So it shows the best performance on the training, on the uh, testing data set with an R squared of 0 0.96. Um, the next two in terms of performance would be the random forest and the decision uh, three. Okay, so uh, this table basically indicates the R squared as well as the uh, RMSE uh, values uh, of these um, machine learning uh, algorithms for training and testing of the, the data sets. And based on this performance, uh, we can uh, rank them and see which one is basically the best. Uh, and we have uh, obviously XGB as the best in this case uh, for training. Uh, decision tree is the second on testing. It's the third. And then uh, random forest is the third for training and second for testing. 
Okay, now let's go uh, with another example. And this is a slope stability uh, analysis. Perhaps this problem does not uh, need an introduction. So the most uh, influential parameters, factors are basically unit weight, cohesion, uh, internal friction angle of the slope, uh, the height of the slope, and also uh, a coefficient which kind of represents the pore water pressure coefficient. And the output of the model is basically the status of the slope, which can be either stable or unstable. And in this study, uh, slopes with factor of safety larger than 1.3 were considered stable. Now there's one interesting point about uh, the application of ML methods here. And the, it's very interesting because here uh, we have used the finite element uh, method actually to simulate the slope stability, generate the data for the training of our models. And after that, we have actually used this, um, uh, we have used these trained models to predict the uh, slope stability on actual cases. On, uh, maybe if I show the next slide. So we are using finite element simulation to generate the data, the input data, train the data set based, based on numerical simulation. But then for testing or um, predictive uh, purposes, we have used the real data. Here we also uh, use the tenfold cross-validation. In general, this is called k-fold cross-validation. So tenfold uh, cross-validation is to evaluate the performance of a model on a given uh, data set. So the, the technique actually involves uh, partitioning the data into 10 equal parts or folds, if you like. Then the algorithm is trained on nine of the 10 folds and tested on the remaining one. So we use 90% of the data to train and then 10 to test it. And this process is repeated basically 10 times. And each time uh, we use a different part of the test and the remaining uh, nine parts as a training uh, data set. Okay, uh, now let's have a look at uh, some of the results here. Uh, the best, uh, the best one uh, in terms of the uh, accuracy, because this is a classification problem. We want to classify the slope as uh, basically stable or unstable. We have uh, the hybrid stacking ensemble with a performance of 0 0.91, uh, MLP with 0 0.81 and the support vector machine with 0 0.82. Uh, now, this is the RFC care for this problem. Obviously, uh, it's uh, related to the area of the care of the area under this curve. And um, basically, if the area is one, that's 100% uh, um, uh, correct prediction. So the closer to one, the better the performance. Again, we, we can see AUC is 0 0.9 for the uh, hybrid uh, ensemble. And the next one is MLP with a performance of 0 point, or AUC value of 0 0.83. After slope stability, now uh, I present another problem, uh, dynamic penetration. And, I'm not sure how I'm going with the time and how much time I have, but I've got uh, two more examples and hopefully that um, will be, there will be enough time. But if I'm going over time, Christian, please <laughs> let me know. Okay, uh, the, uh, so the dynamic penetration problem is actually uh, when a, a penetrometer uh, penetrates into an object. So in terms of penet uh, penetrator, we have, we know its mass, velocity, geometry, and the material. For the target, we are dealing the material uh, pro uh, properties of the target and the penetration characteristics uh, include time and uh, depth of uh, penetration as well as target resistance. Um, 
Why is it important? Especially in geotech, we have some applications. One of them is the torpedo anchors, which are used for uh, anchoring uh, floating um, rigs in uh, offshore engineering. Another one uh, is we have these penetrometers called free falling penetrometers. They are fantastic devices for uh, basically site investigation where you, we can't do a CPT and especially in seabeds, ocean beds, you drop this penetrometer, you measure the depth and time of penetration, and the aim is to work out the mechanical properties of the soil based on penetration uh, characteristics, and they are becoming very popular in the industry uh, nowadays. We have two types of problems here. So the problem is given the shape, initial velocity, and mass of the object, and soil properties find the total depth and total time of penetration. This is basically for a numerical method to uh, predict the depth and time of penetration. In reality, when it comes to the use of penetrometers for site investigation, we have the shape, initial velocity, and mass of the object. We can also measure the total depth and time of penetration, but the question is, what are the soil properties? So it's like an inverse uh, problem here. Uh, Let's ignore about the numerical methods. And I, um, in terms of mechanical properties of the soil, we are considering three parameters, undrained shear strength, it's uh, shear modulus, and also lambda. La uh, lambda is a parameter which uh, it's called rate parameter, and it shows how the shear strength of the soil increases according to the uh, uh, rate of uh, shear strength. So, um, with the with these um, properties, um, we did a study uh, about ten years ago, and we were able to find some uh, uh, we were able to find some relations between these uh, parameters. So, the relation that we found between the penetration characteristics and the soil parameters is a little bit complicated, and. Here we have the impact energy of the penetrometer, uh, half m uh, v zero squared. This is the uh, impact velocity when it reaches the, um, the, the soil surface. Uh, it's normalized by the shear strength of the soil and the diameter of the penetrometer and is equal to this parameter NDP, which is the dynamic uh, penetration factor. Now, NDP depends on the penetration, P. In addition, it also uh, it, it depends on the rate parameter, which represents the shear strength increase due to rate effects. Also depends on the rigidity index, which is the ratio between the uh, shear modulus and the undrained shear strength of the soil. Now, um, if we are considering this uh, uh, free falling penetrometer in to work out the mechanical properties of the soil, which are these three parameters G, SU, and lambda. We have three unknowns, so we must do at least three tests in order to find these three unknowns. Three equations, three unknowns. Even if we do at least three tests at a point, it's still not. Uh, possible to work out uh, these uh, equations because it's uh, highly nonlinear and it's very complicated and it cannot be solved uh, easily. So the idea is to use machine learning to, for this purpose. So uh, we have used several machine learning for in this study. The rates, uh, the range of the parameters considered in this study for D, for M, uh, the mass of the penetrometer, the, its initial velocity, SU, the under and shear strength, uh, the rigidity index, we also have the rate parameter. So these are the values used uh, for the, uh, the ranges used for those parameters. And the measured um, in uh, basically in our finite element simulation, uh, the normalized depth of penetration and the time of penetration are in these uh, ranges. Now, uh, we did a cross-validation to uh, pick the best candidate and then to proceed with that best candidate and optimize it and uh, find the uh, best machine learning. 
So among those 10 um, candidates, uh, the best one uh, in terms of uh, predicting the shear strength and then the shear modulus and the rate parameter was XGB. So the extreme uh, gradient boosting was basically the best one uh, to predict SU and then the shear modulus, the same XGB had the best performance and also um, for the lambda, the rate parameter, uh, XGB had the best uh, performance. So uh, here in summary, we observed that uh, XGB had the best uh, performance amongst other uh, machine learning methods for this uh, penetration problem. Now, uh, after assessing the performance of these uh, nominated uh, methods, we selected XGB to proceed with developing a predictive model. Now, um, in other words, uh, we uh, parameter tuning is performed to further improve the results obtained by uh, XGB method. So we use some uh, optimization algorithms for this purpose. Now the new results obtained after XGB is tuned are shown here. So even a better performance. So for S predicting the SU, uh, we could get an R squared of 0 0.9 for shear modulus 0 0.94, and eventually for lambda parameter 0 0.91, which is uh, in my experience with this uh, penetration problem and outstanding uh, result. Okay, we have used this for other applications as well, SWCC of unsaturated soil, thermal conductivity of soils, um, unconfined compression strength, mechanical behavior of parameters, and a few other applications, but I'm not gonna uh, talk about this tonight. But let me get to the final example. And actually, uh, I'm actually exiting my comfort zone here and present further application of ML in increasing the uh, efficiency of stochastic actual uh, reliability analysis in geotechnical engineering. So we all know that given the inherent uh, uncertainties uh, in properties of soil and rocks, usually the deterministic solutions to typical geotechnical applications may not really guarantee a safe design. So for example, the inherent soil strength variability can significantly influence the slope stability problem. Now to address these uh, uncertainties, the application of stochastic uh, methods has become uh, popular amongst uh, us, the geotechnical researchers during uh, past two, three decades. So what has happened basically, uh, combining the random field theory uh, and the finite element method has led to the random uh, field finite element method, RFEM. Uh, which is one of the most uh, widely used stochastic methods uh, and provides uh, robust uh, results for a wide range of, uh, of geotechnical problems such as bearing capacity of soil and slope stability. Now, uh, what's the main problem here? The problem begins actually when we want to incorporate the variability of mechanical properties of, uh, of soil using uh, RFEM. Uh, with a, let's say, a stochastic method such as the uh, Monte Carlo uh, simulations. So if we want to have an acceptable range of um, analyzers, then this may involve thousands of random field numerical simulations to uh, create the required stochastic data. Uh, now, when we when we deal with small values of the probability of failure, PF, uh, the Monte Carlo technique uh, can lead to a high number of uh, required simulations. So for a small PF values, the coefficient of variation of the estimated PF is a function of the number of uh, Monte Carlo simulation according to this uh, uh, equation. Now this equation shows uh, that for a, a probability failure, a small pro probability of failure, if uh, we need uh, 
to obtain a covariance of PF in the order of 10 to minus one. And to do so, we need the number of Monte Carlo simulation in the order of 100 divided by uh, this uh, PF, which means a lot of simulation. So in generally speaking, in a typical geotech application, that means around 2000 or 2500 uh, simulation which is uh, computationally might be inefficient and takes a lot of time. So overcoming this challenge, there are a couple of methods in the literature. Uh, one of them is the variance reduction methods. The other one is approximated surrogates or, or uh, meta models. I don't really have time to go through this. Uh, some of you, or perhaps my dear colleague Christian here would say, why not use limit analysis? Of course, that's another solution but um, we are talking about machine learning methods. And I wanna show you how we can use machine learning method to actually improve this uh, Monte Carlo uh, simulation. Okay, so here I basically talk uh, how we can use the ML methods to overcome this challenge by significant reduction of computational time using um, or without decreasing, without or changing uh, the accuracy of the analysis. Again, I really apologize to those researchers who have done a lot of fantastic work in this area, but I cannot address their work due to our time constraints. Um, okay, uh, consider a slope stability problem again. Um, this consists of an undrained layer of clay with a shear strength value of SU, so only one parameter SU, but with a random field. So to characterize uh, the soil random fields, the point of statistics are chosen based on the practical ranges uh, recommended in the, in the literature. The point of statistics here consists of the uh, mean, uh, mu, the mean value, and the standard devi deviation uh, uh, sigma, the standard division of the undrained shear strength uh, SU. Uh, also the covariance of SU is uh, the ratio between the standard deviation and the mean uh, value. So this value is um, basically uh, selected to change between 10 to 50% um, for this clay soil. Another, um, in addition to those point statistics, we also need to consider the spatial uh, statistics in the generation of a random field. So this is characterized by a critical um, statistical parameter, which is known as the correlation distance, also called the scale of uh, fluctuation uh, delta. This parameter indicates the distance within which the property um, values show a relatively strong correlation. A very short correlation distance leads to independent uh, property value at different points. Uh, so keep, keep that in mind. And a very large correlation distance will also indicate highly correlated or nearly equal property values at different uh, points. Uh, we have the correlation uh, in horizontal and also vertical uh, directions. And these are the recommended values for this cor uh, correlation uh, distances in the uh, literature. So we are basically dealing with four parameters to generate a random field, um, mean of undrained shear strength, these values, coefficient of variation 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, the horizontal correlation distance delta H16, 12, 25. And for the vertical one, we also only considered uh, one. Now, a typical example of how the shear strength uh, profile looks like with changing these parameters is uh, shown here. And um, now for each of the, this, uh, let's say, uh, random field label, uh, if we work out the number of required Monte Carlo simulation for each set, uh, we have roughly five, uh, 2000. 2000, we have five different values of uh, mu. So that's five times 2000 
for all of them, we roughly need uh, 120,000 uh, Monte Carlo uh, simulation. Now, we have used um, the machine learning aided Monte Carlo uh, strategy here. We have tested the performance of three machine learning methods, uh, support vector, random forest, and artificial uh, neural network. So, um, in this uh, method, actually, the uh, these ML algorithms uh, are used as surrogate models. So, what does a surrogate model mean? Uh, a surrogate model in machine learning is actually a simplified model that is built uh, to approximate the behavior of a more complex system or model, and its uh, purpose is to provide a computationally efficient and less complex, uh, let's say, alternative to the original model, while still uh, doesn't change the accuracy uh, of the prediction. Okay, um, now uh, let's uh, skip this algorithm, but what is important to note here is uh, when we uh, use this method, we basically, we first train the machine learning algorithm just using 1% um, of the data, one or 2%. Now, if that one or 2% is not enough to uh, satisfy a certain uh, accuracy, then we increase and add another 1% of random field. And then based on that, we uh, work out uh, the performance of the method. Now, uh, these are the ACC and AUC uh, versus the um, that ratio between the horizontal and vertical correlation um, uh, distance. We have trained the model based using only 500, uh, but we have uh, used the method to predict 9,500 uh, tests. And the performance in most cases is pretty good, but it decreases, the accuracy decreases as this variable uh, increases. And um, the other interesting thing here is um, there are so many numbers on this slide, unfortunately, and I apologize for that. But uh, let me remind you that in this study, uh, we performed a full Monte Carlo analysis with a total number of 120,000, just to compare it with the machine learning aided Monte Carlo and see how it differs. So this table basically shows that the test data set size has not have any effect on our accuracy. So in all cases, we have trained um, the, we have used a train uh, set size of 500, and then we have done the test size using 500 or 9,500. And this is the actual, the maximum difference between these two test uh, scenarios. And the difference is really uh, uh, negligible. And my last uh, point is about the computational time. Um, so the CPU time for each random uh, finite difference uh, or finite limit simulation without the factor of safety calculation to determine the uh, stability status of the slope is roughly 43 seconds on average, um, 43 seconds for one Monte Carlo simulation. And I have used normalized uh, time here. So um, let's say if for the entire data set, I want to do 120,000 simulations, the required time uh, without factor of safety is around this normalized time. It can be minutes, it can be hour, 6,000. But if instead of doing 120,000, if I just do, let's say 1% of it, which is uh, 1,200, and then I train my data set, my machine learning using these samples, and then I use the machine learning method to predict the rest of them, I only use this much and that much in the accuracy. So that's the difference in the error percentage in the probability of failure if I 
train my model using only 1200 and then apply it to the rest of the entire data set, that's how much uh, I use in term, I lose in terms of the accuracy. Anyway, uh, that's my final uh, remarks here. <laughs> Sorry, Christian, I know I went a bit over time, but this is the final slide. So I hope that I've been able to demonstrate some of the applications of machine learning methods in geotechnical engineering. Whether the ML methods can replace numerical methods or laboratory testing, I don't know. I leave this to you so you can answer for me. Uh, I can only tell you that we cannot ignore the importance of these methods and their impacts on our lives. Uh, so perhaps they are able to play a significant role in our business uh, uh, as well. And this is not actually the end of my journey here. I have many plans for future. And uh, let's 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 uh, end it here, and let's have some time for taking uh, questions and uh, any discussion. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Majid. Uh, that was a very interesting uh, webinar, uh, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions. There's already um, you can you can put up your hand. Uh, as I said, we can do this in two ways. You can either type in your question, or if you want to speak. Uh, live to um, Majid and ask your question in person, then um, you're welcome to do that as well. You can put up your uh, raise your hand, uh, and then I will uh, put you online. But uh, while we think about that, we can take some of the questions that have been written in um, during the webinar, Majid, if you don't mind. First, uh, a, a, a practical one uh, is: Can we get the slides? Um, I would suggest you get in touch with Majid about that directly, and I'm sure he'll be able to to help you. Um, uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. If you want the slides, I don't mind. I mean, uh, send me an email. I've got you've got my email address here, and I'm more than happy to share the slides with you. Yeah, and there's also uh, some questions regarding where to get started with this whole business of machine learning um, if you're a beginner and again maybe that's a question that's best directed to you by email uh, I guess it, this webinar was was sort of an introduction to at least um, some of the applications in geomechanics but it's of course it's a vast field and I'm sure Majid you have some references uh, some textbooks or whatnot for beginners that you can recommend to people uh, yeah, uh, definitely. That's a yes, Christian. And uh, fortunately, these uh, machine learning methods uh, are relatively well established. And I forgot to mention that why we use it now. When, when you look at these methods uh, in the literature, there are standard textbooks maybe back in 1940s, 1930s, where people uh, we're discussing about uh, artificial intelligence. And it's not a new topic, but it's a hot topic. And it's become more popular recently because our computational power has increased, basically. So the majority of these methods are, um, <laughs> are belong to a stone age, <laughs> let's say. <laughs> uh, but recently, we have become very powerful in terms of computing. So they have attracted our attention. That's why uh, maybe this is a very good time to pay more attention to these methods, especially in geotechnical engineering. I'm pretty sure there are many, many works to be done. And this is just the beginning. I mean, I'm quite new to this business. First time I thought about machine learning was when we were still at University of Newcastle back in 2013. And I wrote a discovery project application about this. <laughs> But they told me, oh, you're still a new boy. Yeah. Yeah, I, I <laughs> no <remember>. way. <laughs> yeah, so, but I wasn't disappointed. So it's always time to learn. And uh, fortunately, I've had the pleasure of, privilege of working with the fantastic people who are, are now experts in this area. They yeah. know even better than me. Yeah. But anyway, so yeah, there are many, many references. Literature yeah. is massive about these methods. Yeah. Um, 
how many samples are needed um, for a prediction of the factor of safety of slope stability analysis? Is a question. Uh, one of the questions, um, which is there is no magical number, so the more the better. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't really have a magical number for this. But if you are referring to the last example I showed for Monte Carlo simulation, that was about 2000. Um, but um, in slope, how many samples? I don't have a number for it. Yeah, but it's thousands, uh, I would say uh, tens of thousands. But Definitely. The, the, these these can be generated also uh, very easily with a software like Optum, um, yep. like you have done it, Majid. I mean, it, it you set it running and then um, you come back. Of course, if you have some sort of parallel capabilities, that's yep. even better. But if not, then yep. um, uh, from my experience, not exactly with this, but with sort of random field analysis, where you also need a lot of samples, um, is that you can quite easily do a, a thousand slope stability analysis in a, in a couple of hours. So then you can scale Correct. it up. Yep. Uh, 10,000 is sort of 24 hours also, uh, and so on, um, on a single on a single process or so. Maybe that, that yep. gives some indication. Yep. Some some uh, other technical questions. Um, for the case of pile bearing capacity, the data set was relatively small, 59. Uh, yep. And um, what about the, uh, um, is that, um, is that, um, is that sufficient to really um, draw any firm conclusions? Well, a few, a few, we, um, well, in essentially, it may not seem enough. Okay, it it was a uh, relatively a small number, but I didn't have the time to explain the beta method, and you can use the beta method to produce more uh, data cases and verify your uh, prediction with that uh, beta, which is a theoretical method, and. That's what we did. We actually verified our um, predictions with the beta method as well. Okay. Um, just maybe a couple more now. They're really coming in. Um, yep. a, a general question: what what kind of what kind of that that several people have asked? What kind of problems in geomechanics do you think are sort of the best candidates for machine learning? Look, I have seen many, many applications in geomechanics, but uh, one of the applications that I am personally very interested, in, and I think we had a discussion about this last year or uh, last time we had a chat with each other, Christian, is uh, can we use a machine learning method for predicting a load displacement? Mm -hmm. Let's not just uh, talk about one single output like a bearing capacity or probability of failure or if the slope is a stable, unstable, not that kind of problems. But let's say you have, for instance, a foundation in offshore. This is a very practical problem for design of uh, monopiles. And can you predict the load displacement using machine learning? That's one of the problems that I am personally very interested in, and I haven't come across any kind of uh, solutions in the literature of machine learning. Sure. Um, yeah, and, and what a uh, question, a very interesting question, I think, what is your success uh, criterion of a machine learning model before you can use it in design? <laughs> I, I, I guess that's not so easy to answer, but it's uh, like asking I, I, what I, what factor of safety do you use in design, and one point five or one point eight or two. So same here. So you can measure the performance uh, by using those uh, uh, matrix like R squared. So tell me, R squared zero point nine is it acceptable to you, or you want zero point nine five, or do you accept? an R squared 
performance of 0 0.7. So I, I don't know, maybe there is a good answer here, but I'm not really sure about it. So I think it depends on the problem and how reliable your data set is. Are you 100%? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, I, I, I would tend to agree with that. So it's, uh... It's something that maybe that sort of should be codified, right? I mean, at the end of the day, you agree on some number like the partial factors um, that is acceptable and then experience shows that uh, they indeed are acceptable, if not more than acceptable. And then, but uh, getting to that is probably, is probably not a, a short path. It's probably something that's going to take a bit of time, <laughs> I would imagine. Um, well, that's a very good question, honestly. That's, uh... Uh, that's a very good question but yeah as we said uh... yeah um, also something uh, that I've actually been wondering uh, both with you and with uh, people doing um, machine learning um, using machine learning is that do you code your algorithms from scratch or do you make use of open open uh, source software like there's something called scikit learn tensorflow etc yeah yeah well um and anything you can recommend <laughs> any any tools you can recommend well that scikit has uh, basically a lot of uh, written or already written um uh, methods in python in mm -hmm. python so personally i have not written uh, or developed any functions for those uh, algorithms because they are all there and they have written perhaps in the most optimized way. So I don't really need to reinvent the wheel. It's already theirs and we have been using them. Yeah. Uh, so Python is, is, is the go-to language for machine learning, you would say. Uh, yeah, I would say that. Yeah, Python. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know people use R as well, but uh, or even MATLAB. MATLAB is very popular as well for some. Yeah, but uh, in terms methods. of the in terms of the number of packages and so on that are available. Oh, I oh think, yeah, uh, I, I don't. I think... would say Python. Python, yeah. yeah Python is the way to go. I think it would be difficult to... Well, if there are any experts on, amongst the audience and they have other views, I'm more than happy to hear their views, but I would say Python is the way to yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, there are a few other questions, but I'm afraid we will have to cut it. We are sort of on a... We have a, a time limit here. So uh, I would encourage you to get in touch directly with Majid to continue the discussion. And, sure. Um, I would like to thank you for attending and uh, thanks for your questions. And we will be um, announcing a new webinar shortly. We're gonna have these about, I think once a month. So, um, so that'll be the next one will be announced um, shortly. So thank you everyone. And, and thank you to Majid as well. And uh, see Our you pleasure. next time. Yeah, thanks all. Thanks.